going on quite some adventures together. So um, I never thought that this would happen, but I really feel close to this man and then close to the people. Um, so I'm just really, really thrilled to kind of introduce my friend, uh, Dean Barlis, and my friend, Donna Cassette. So, um, let me figure out how to work this microphone. Hamuna nagana ni adana kisa i toi te kare i kup te kare i agai te kare. I'm glad to be invited to talk today. But my name is Donna Kisa. I'm Northern Paiute, and the band that I'm from is the Toi Te Kare Tribe, which is the Cattail Eaters. And I also have family relations in many of the other bands in Northern Paiute. And um, Kup Te Kare is ground squirrel eaters. They're from the Love Block. And Agai Te Kare, which is trout eater from the Waka River Paiute Tribe. And I do have family relations here in the uh, Kuyui Takeda, the Kuyui fish from Pyramid Lake. They're an ancient fish, and they were at one point on the list for um, endangered species. And the tribe has worked to bring their numbers up, and they are able to be removed from that list. But um, uh, born and raised in Nevada, and welcome to our homelands. And this too is a part of it. Uh, just a little quick history on where we're from. Now we've been here in this territory since time immemorial, before any other thought. We don't have stories or origin stories coming from a different place. That's how long we've been here. So if you go and you walk around in the playa, look beyond you know, the artwork and the people, look at the mountains. You're gonna see like this um, etching on the side of the mountains. It kind of just goes from left to right. And those are remnants from an ancient lake, and that would have been ancient Lake Lahontan. It dried up about 12,000 years ago. And we have stories of when that lake was here. And, you know, we have stories after the drying up of the lake. And, you know, we've just, we've been here for so long because this is our Eden. We were protected in this territory because of now the desert. We were able to live our traditional way of life, probably the longest of anybody in North America because nobody wanted to come through here. And if you made it to this spot, you had to know a little something about survival, about navigating the desert, how to travel, how to move, how to be with other people. And so we were pretty much protected. Not to say that we didn't have our own battles with other neighboring tribes, you know, we, we had some of that. But um, we've been here for a very, very, very long time. We have many of our bands um, are known for what we eat. And I am Toy Takeda, cattail eater. So the part that we like to eat is the roots. So you get them in the springtime, you get them, and you know, clean them up, and they kind of taste like a cucumber, crunchy like a water chestnut, um, and they're very sweet. You could use the pollen. The cattail itself is sustainable, and it's um, we use it for our everything. We use it for our houses. Our we have boats. My tribe is in a marsh area, Stillwater Marsh, and so we have little boats that we navigate with poles, not paddles. And so we're able to go through and use this material for our shoes, our clothing, our mats, our houses, um, our cradle boards of some you know sorts. And so it was our everything. And it does such a good job, and it's such a useful plant material that it grows all over the world. We're gifted with this all over the world. And but it does such a good job of cleaning up our environment. It's able to take out those toxins out of the water and it's able to purify the land again. And with that, it does such a good job, we can't eat it anymore. Because what happened upstream, now where are we? Why did people come out west through this territory? They have mining, there's gold in them, there are hills, some silver, some all kinds of stuff. So the people who came out first, the miners and 
my tribe, when you're talking about the Great Basin, it's an area of internal drainage. We don't have waters that go to the ocean. So when people came out west and they were trying to find the fastest, easiest passage, they often go through the routes that are heavily traveled and it's right next to the water rivers. So we don't have that here. So you have to go from one river to the next river to the next river to the next to get to where you're going, which is west. And because of that, what happens here stays here, like for real. If there's contamination upstream, it's going to come to our area, our environment. And that's exactly what happened in my tribe and many other tribes. Most of our water is considered, uh, what do they call them? Uh, browns? Brown, brown, yeah, yeah, they're all contaminated. So ours was one of the first ones because of Virginia City. There was a lot of mercury that was released in our water and then it, it killed off a large part of our band. And they were, it was around this time of year and uh, a lot of the families were in the hills pine it picking. Pine it is one of our winter substance that we have along with rabbits and whatnot. And it wiped out a lot of the people who were in camp, but you could see the contamination happening in our communities really fast. And so with that, I was talking to one of our elders and he's since passed on and I said, you know, we can't eat our cattails anymore because they are triggered with heavy metals. You can't eat them. Women can't, children can't eat too much of them. Actually, they can't eat them. We can only eat limited amounts. And I said, so we're kai toy to cut it. We're not, we can't eat, you know, cattails anymore. So what do we call ourselves? And he sat there and he was thinking about it. He rubbed his chin and he looked around and he said, we're McDonald's to cut it. <laughs> so anyways, I'm Danica said. I am McDonald's to cut it. <laughs> I'll let Dean talk here for a minute. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dean Barley. I'm Kuyu to cut. That's the ancient fish in Pyramid Lake. My other side, we call them Agaitsi. They come from Warm Springs in Oregon. And that's my family. Mama. My mom and dad, no, they moved to Nixon when we had to go to school. But I was raised with my grandma and grandpa also. They were fluent speakers of the Paiute language. Really fluent speakers, so. We have plans for our place in Nixon. Before my dad passed away, we said, oh, he wanted a garden like a community garden for our people. So our people can get back to eating healthy food again without all the contaminants and the GMO or whatever they put in the corn and things nowadays. So we're getting food together. We're getting seeds. We got seeds coming from Mexico and from Hopi country, Diné country in Arizona. People are slowly hearing what we're trying to do with our garden, making a big community garden one day. But um, we came out here, when was it, in June, May? Burners Without Borders had a meeting, gathering at Fly Ranch. So we got to talking out there. I met a lot of gardeners, things like that. And I know they were saying we can able, they're able to help us put together like buildings, not big, but one day I'd like to see a storage shed because I have so much junk in my rooms, in the rooms upstairs. And one day we want to move all that out and um, move it into a storage shed so we can put my things in there. I say junk, but people must really think they're 
things I hold dear, I guess. You know, so there's so much in my room, uh, especially people come into my room and they're all amazed because I have so much ceremonial things in there also. I said, wow, well, it's like coming into a museum and looking out at all the things I have that we use in ceremonies. But, you know, I don't know your process of getting help to put a storage shed up for me. One day, you know, we'll find out later, but um, we're just sharing. We did a talk at center camp, sharing our culture, tradition. At one time, this was all underwater, fresh water. And if you can imagine, these mountains, they're barren now, but back then they had trees on them. And like Donna said, our old people would make boats out of tulies and cattails. I said, oh, I don't know, they're pretty tough going across the ocean or the water, going island to island, then hunting or gathering. Some of the oldest basketry in the world has been found here in the Great Basin, in this area. I mean, thousands and thousands of years old before anywhere else the baskets were made here woven here made from the native material here and a lot of the teachings we take we carry our teaching from the old people they say the teachings from the old people and you go back thousands of years, like I said, the basketry. We had to learn to do the basketry to survive out here. When the things started changing, the water started drying up. We had to learn, we adapted to living in a desert. Our people did starve. There was, you know, in many tribes you find the role that men and women had to do, but here it was different. The man had to learn how to gather seeds, how to process the food. The women had to learn how to hunt. They, were, they tell us that some of the women were better hunters than the men. And some of the men were probably the best basket makers you would ever get to meet. So there was no division between male and female here. And that's our teachings that's always been here. In our Paiute way, there are straight men and straight women. There are homosexual or gay men, gay women, and there was transgender. And we had five genders within our people. People asked how, before the operations came, how were our people transgender? Way back when, way before Christianity. Our people were born both male and female. And that's to carry what we also carry today, continue to carry. There was no hatred towards any, anyone. And we still carry that. I was raised, you treat people the way you want to be treated. So you come to my house, we'll offer you water, coffee, whatever we have. They'll always ask, how did you eat already? If you say no, then we'll start making you something to eat, feed you, be generous. The hospitality, we still carry that within our people, not all of our people. Assimilation did a big number on our people. But there's a few of us where all of this was hidden underground. And lately it's been coming out strong, very strong among our people. And we were given in 1872 our language, culture, tradition, spirituality was all outlawed. And it came back in 1978 to an act of Congress. They said, oh, you guys can worship 
in your Indian ways again for a country based on it getting away from and the freedom of religion coming here that was awkward for us to see and deal with but anyway we're here to share and welcome you to our homelands you may think it's nothing but when there's water here there's little shrimp that come to life they're underneath the playa in the winter time springtime when life comes they'll come to life you'll be able to see little shrimp swimming in the rainwater snow that's left over then it dries up and they go back underground so we know this land we know the sacred areas north of us the mountains the high mountains Ishikai they call this big mountain north of Gurla and these other mountains they have sacred places way years and years before Burning Man even came out here we would come out with my elders and do prayers out there. We'd come in the middle of the playa and do prayers because we were in the middle of seeing the sacred areas that we know. Now all my elders are gone and I'm the elder one that's left that used to come out here and do the blessings out here years and years before Burning Man even came here. But um, so it's always special up really special place in my heart. So we wanted to share that with you. Also, you know, we were more than willing to answer questions if you got something that you really need to ask. When I first came to Burning Man, that was in 2001, we met people from the East Coast who never seen an Indian. I was amazed at that. I said, what? You never seen Indians? They thought we were all gone. They thought, you know, we didn't exist anymore. We met people from the Czech Republic in 1921, They knew who Indians were. They were really glad to meet us. I remember first time we came here in 2001, one of the geisha houses from Japan was here. It was really neat to see them dressed up, the geisha women dressed up with a white face, paint the whole thing, walking in the playa, in the dust, <laughs> walking to the white out back then. Back then I was young, was able to sleep on, we all camped out and helped each other. Didn't matter where you came from. Everybody helped each other. Set up tents, there were shades. We had tents. It was more like tent city back then. Everybody had tent. You slept on a hard playa, like sleeping on cement back then. Now that I got old, I have to sleep on something soft. I have to be able to get up out of bed. But we don't, you know. We come out for one day and one night, come out and check it out and go back home. But uh, I think next year we'll plan on staying out here the whole week again. So, so anyway, we came here Saturday after we blessed the temple. Now I was asking about the young man that made us espresso. <laughs> They said he's still probably asleep, so we'll maybe drop by later. And I have a gift for him. You know, it's been a long time since we had good espresso. So me and my nephew were told, oh, we're gonna have to get us a machine now. Learn how to make good coffee. Um, in the late 80s, I believe, mid-80s, we had my first taste of French press coffee. And growing up, all we drank was Folgers. So to me, French press tasted like uh, it was burnt. And we dumped it. 
the guy that offered it to us, you know, when he'd leave the room, we'd dump his coffee out. It tastes burnt. And we were laughing. He came, yeah, you guys drink a lot of coffee. Did he make us another pot? That was my first experience with good coffee. And later, you know, we went to Portland. Portland had the only other Starbucks at that time. Back then, when we were younger, we used to travel. We had a drum group, singing group. We'd go to all, the, hit all the powwows in California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. We even went into Canada and do Alberta, Saskatchewan, Hope, um, Manitoba, just traveling every weekend, singing, doing our drumming powwow world travels at that time. And that was my growing up. In 74, I was sent off to a boarding school in Utah. That was a big old boarding school. They called it Inner Mountain. And, um, for a coffee maker. Yay. Made, made really good espresso Sunday or Saturday. So. And we have, you know, it's always a giving thing. We always try to make things to give. Sometimes, you know, we had to diabetic neuropathy, messed my hands up. I used to really do really good beat work at one time. We do the small beads like this, even smaller, micro beads they call them. Some of the beads you can't get nowadays. I said, one of my friends was saying, you need to get a passport. He wants to take me to the Czech Republic where they still make beads. One of the really fantastic bead makers in the world. We still have old beads that come from the Czech, Repu Czech Republic from a long time ago. So, and we're here to ask questions. If you want to ask questions, you want something you to ask, free, feel free to come up and ask. You have to talk a little loud because, like I said, I got old and can't hear. So, yeah, so I have two questions. Um, one around Pyramid Lake, since you spoke of being the, the eaters of the fish out of Pyramid Lake. I've been told that there's been starting to release more water. I think Right, um, Pyramid Lake, you know, we've gone through a lot of legal issues with the government, the state, upstream users with the lake, water, getting water. As you know, they built Derby Dam in 1906, something like that. The first reclamation project in the United States to call the water, most of the water, to Pelham that area down, you know, still water for their farmers. But now we've won a lot of legal issues and we're getting a lot more fresh water into the lake. So we reintroduced the old lot and cutthroat trout that used to be in there and they took them out, took them out, <clears throat> but they returned. So now we're getting the hot and cut goat trout that are like 25 pound fish again. So the fishery is coming back to what it used to be, which is good. No, we, the 
that cutthroat trout is really unique. That's what our people survived on for thousands of years. Also the kuyui, we call them kuyui, kuyui, an old sucker fish that's been in a lake. They live up to 40 some years old, long living fish with their bottom feeders and they're able to come into the river and spawn again. The trout are able to spawn. We have hatcheries that raise the trout. So we seem to be doing good with the fisheries. <clears throat> now, Thacker Pass, we call it Bihimu, our old name for Thacker Pass. Pre contact. There was a massacre there. At one time, there were tribes pushing us eastward. So that was an old massacre site, pre-contact, by a tribe we call Ishisha, Pit River tribe in California. And that sparked a long war between us and the Pit River tribe, and we pushed them back into California. And they were known for cutting people when they killed them. They cut the guts open and they stringed the guts out on the sagebrush to intimidate us. And then we didn't deal with anyone until the military came at Thacker Pass in 1865, they massacred our people there again. And that's why we had to stand up because our people back then weren't allowed to go back into there and take care of the dead, to do the burial, do the prayers over them. 1864 to 1868, there was a war of genocide against our Paiute and Shoshone people here we call it Snake War. And that Thacker Pass happened at that time in 1865, March of 1865. There was a massacre there. Our people are still out there. We had to stand up and try to save them. Bureau of Land Management lied to the federal judge in Reno, Nevada, or America Lithium also. Their lawyers lied to the federal judge Thing. There was no such thing as a massacre there. But BLM had the papers from a year later when somebody went out there and did a survey and found all the remains of our people, the bones of our people from the massacre the year before. So they lied, their lawyers lied to the federal judge. So there's no such thing as a massacre that happened but their own documents prove otherwise. The mountain, the peak there, not a mountain, it's a high area. That was a sacred place where our people go and pray. So we had to stand. Last year we went out there. I was in my wheelchair. We got on the road and blocked the excavator that was trying to continue his work. He was running and he came up against us straight up like that. And we sat there, did our prayers, sat there and they stopped. We stopped them for two days, but Decker Pass is, they're continuing their work. But we tried, we had to show the world that we're willing to stand up and protect our sacred sites. We will always do that. Lithium is something that's coming to Nevada. Nevada has old 1872 mining laws. So anything that mine that want to come in, they're going to devastate our people, our burial sites, our sacred sites, because of that 1872 mining law Nevada has. So they're expecting 500 more lithium mines to come in to the state of Nevada. And it's 
going to devastate our land, our water. And I told, there was a documentary done. I told them, long after America is gone and no longer exists, we'll still be here. And we'll still have to deal with the devastation, contamination, like the nuclear waste, the nuclear testing they did in the East. They don't talk about our native people that have such a high rate of cancer nowadays. Young people, elders, we have to deal with all that contamination. You people come here and think, no, there ain't nothing here, it's just desert. You never see, went out and seen the beautiful places I've seen over the years. Sacred places, cultural places, strong places. I just wanted to say that on a Nevada or America Lithium. All this is a Canadian based company. And they say whether they wanted it or not, China has a big part in that company also. That's a thing people don't talk about. So that's a little that I know about Nevada Lithium, America Lithium, Lithium America. And we'll continue to, to stand up and fight for what we believe is right. And that'll always be where I stand. Thank you. If you would like to talk about it, I would love to hear you tell everyone about the work that you both have been doing with repatriating human remains to tribes, mm. and maybe a little bit about the process of giving someone a proper burial once you do get the um, remains back. The work I do? I'll, yes. I'll tell you that that was where I really got to know Dean was with um, repatriation. And I was in my young 20s, and we were in Santa Fe, and Dean was there. He's a, he's a real go-getter. He, he went up there to advocate for a return of Pyramid Lakes, ancient remains, and I was there for our tribes. And um, yeah, I've been learning from him ever since, but I'll let Dean start. Um. Learning as as a two spirited person. This is the work we do. A lot of the work we do is dealing with death. Sometimes people, but certain families, once in a while, great while, they'll ask me to go into the mortuary. So I learn. I guess in our tradition, I'm a mortician because I'm able to deal with the bodies, get them dressed for burial. So a lot of times we'll go into the mortuaries and dress the bodies, get them prepared for burial. A lot of times I'm the last one to see the physical face of the person before we wrap them up, cover the face, wrap them in a casket. So I'm like the one that it's the last one to see the physical remain. A lot of times we deal with taking care of them also. I've done so many, officiated so many burials over the years. And that's what I do with our ancestors, the ones that were taken or study in the museums, universities. Over the years I've traveled to New York, I've gone to New York City twice and brought home remains for our people. We've gone to Boston, Chicago, gone to Washington DC, Atlanta, gone into California. So many places where you see our remains just stacked and stacked in their storage areas and they're just 
pile their pile of bones in their mind to us they're still they still have a spirit they still want to come home so when they do come home we take care of them state museum in carson city released 120 remains maybe five years ago so i had to take care of them and within our people our tribe our people are so superstitious or they're scared of handling the remain. So it took a whole week for us to deal with them and get them ready for burial. That's the work I do. I, I also do healing. I've become a healer over the years. Um, I had to quit drinking, quit doing my drugs way back in 89. So I've been sober ever since. And when I sobered up, all of that spiritual help came. The spirit helpers came to me. So I'm trying to teach our young people again to learn these ways, to learn the work I do. I said, you don't have to be too spirited to do the work with our ancestors. You just have to do it. It's something I will never be able to finish in my lifetime. There are so many thousands and thousands of human remains still out there. In California, sad, we sang where they kept all the remains. We sang our spiritual song. And in California, there are so many tribes that no longer exist. All their people are gone. Their remains are there. So when we left, they were saying, what about us? Take us with you. Every time we go by Berkeley, you can feel them. When are you going to come after us? When we want to get buried again. We want to be in our Mother Earth again. That's sad to hear that. The, well, the work, you know. It's a little about the work I do. We have a sweat lodge at the house. We're trying to, I said at center camp, build a better world for all of us. My old people told me, I'm gonna be witness to that new world that's coming. That new world that's gonna change. And I know long after this country no longer exists, we'll still be here but we'll have to deal with the contamination that was left. One day, Mother Earth will just change. Everything will flip. It's, we're getting close to that point now. You can feel it. If you sit out there, you can feel the whole world is, in a sense, losing its mind. We deal with uh, genocide still today you got really close friends that are palestinian they're telling me that the devastation that their people are going to men women children we gotta learn to change really gotta learn to change this whole world and that's my one hope one day, you know, when I go on, we go across the Milky Way to the other side, to where all the ancestors are. But they continue to come and say, that world, that change, that time of chaos is coming so fast now. We got all got to be ready for that. So think about that one. One day, things will change. It's already. We're going through great chaos with the government. Political things are <laughs> really getting crazy. I don't even bother with listening to that anymore. But um, I have my own spiritual things I do have to deal with. More and more people are coming with more and more sickness to ask for help. Cancer, 
all these diseases, they come and ask me. Two-spirit people come dealing with, you know, their sickness. Sickness we all have to deal with as two-spirited. So we talk. We lose so many young people nowadays. They commit suicide. So many of them have so much knowledge, but they see no choice but to take their life. We lose good singers, language speakers, teachers of the our language, fluent speakers. Um, that's a lot I carry. You know, at times it gets so heavy. I just get away from people sometimes and go sit in the mountains or sit along the lake. She's sacred, so we go sit by the lake. Well, that's some of the work I do, not all. <laughs> There's so much other things I do as a spiritual person. But just giving you a quick trip of what I do, of what I have to do. So I got no, I can't back up and say, no, I can't do that. I have no choice but to do, continue, go forward. So thank you for that question. Yeah, Dean's the nice one. <laughs> Me, on the other hand, I'll name names and call you out. And with the repatriation process with my tribe, um, one of the oldest known mummified remains in North America, along with the oldest textiles and decorated baskets, were found um, in with my tribe. And it's with uh, the spirit cave remains. We call, we call him the storyteller because he continues to tell a story. But at the same time, there was one that was the same age, if not older, the wizard speech in Pyramid Lake. And um, in our efforts, it took my tribe from the time we actually had the honor of having to get legislation passed through the federal government in order to even think about getting our oldest of old back. And they only want those because they're curious. They want to continue to test, study, prod, continue to do destructive DNA analysis. Um, our tribe has fought and did not want to do DNA testing. So of course the mentality was, what are you afraid that it's going to show that they're not related to you? to you, a modern day Indian. I was like, one, what's a modern day Indian? Is it because I could dance to Oons Oons music? Cats and boots and boots and cats. But anyways, yeah, so what is that? And so there was a methodical process that happened that I seen because with my family, my grandma, she was uh, one of my great great grandmas. She was fighting with the same man at the Nevada State Museum in 1940 as I was in 1990. She was saying, old Paiutes never lie. So the way that we were raised, we only have one story to tell. And if we lie to ourselves, or we lie to you, we're only lying to ourselves, and that lie will be told generation from generation. So we only have one story. And we were told these things about our people, where we come from, we've been here since time immemorial. And so because there was in Love Lock, which is Kuptika, the ground squirrel eaters, uh, the red-headed giant stories. Who has heard about the red-headed giants in Nevada? Yeah, they're not red and they're not giants. So if you go to their museum, take one of the five bones with you. Hopefully all those bones will be gone in front of their museum there because it's disgusting. So with that, there was a process where they were trying to write us out of our history. So not only our land, not only our language, not only our children, not only you know, our food that we have, it's our history now. We're gonna take our history from us to displace us from this land so we have no valid connection. So were we afraid of doing the DNA testing? No, we were not afraid. There wasn't nobody here. Nobody wanted to be here. This land that you see out here is very inhospitable now. But like I said earlier, some people came in since the beginning. 
and you could see the remnants of an ancient Lake Lahontan that was here 12,000 years ago. We were here before that lake was, was, was here. We, we were told, and that was 21,000 years ago. And you know, what Dean has done and our elders have done, because you know, when we go through, we had to get NACPRA law, Native American Graves Repatriation Act, that was approved in 1990. Then we were, our tribes were able to repatriate our human remains. And through DNA testing, they said, they, that's the only thing they're gonna accept is the DNA testing. So we ended up working with a gentleman, his name is S.K. Willerschleff. He works for the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and he's the world-renowned geogeneticist who does a lot of the genome projects, mapping of the people of the world. So he came here, talked to us, and then we went to Denmark, look you know, how they do their stuff, because we don't believe in uh, destructive analysis. We, one, don't believe in speaking of the dead you carry that ghost sickness with you. We are continually and always have to go against our original teaching, having to even talk and fight for our dead. We, that was a concept that is unfathomable. Um, to take the dead from our homelands, what are you doing with them? In my family's history is that in Lovelock, they were witnessing the dead being taken from these caves. And in this area, we have a series of caves that are around. And the antiquity of them is because of the age and how it's preserved. They're partially mummified because it's a slow drying process. We get that. But um, in Lovelock, they were, um, I lost my train of thought. But anyways, they were, um, witnessing their people being taken and it was found like um, this was during the 20s so what was happening also in the 20s in the world was this other very famous mummified remains was found Tut Tut Common does that sound familiar well they were trying to associate our people here in the Great Basin with the people of Egypt and because they're mummified this really sparked a weird curiosity. You, this theme of this year is curiouser and curiouser. And so they were very fascinated. They, meaning people, non-natives, were enthralled with having some little piece of anything from a cave in Nevada, specifically the Lovelock Cave. So we've seen our people literally scattered along with their patrimony items scattered into museums. If you had one, you were, you know, very well noted. So our um, artifacts and our people were all over the place. But if you were one of these fraternal orders who happened to have rituals of your own and you use human remains in those rituals, even better, right? Yeah. So that's what our people were having to deal with, is um, these things that we found curious. Because who would consume hum humans, the dead? We call them nuna, paizo. <laughs> these are the ones, these are the, the people eaters. You know, she'll come and eat you if you're bad. And, uh, but anyways, these are real to us. And these stories, like my, when our grandfathers and our grandmothers um, hand these stories down to us, it's, it's really hard because the first time we were able to repatriate, there was, we didn't have a, a ceremony. Like, what do we do? What's the ceremony gonna be? There was none. It was done when they were passed away, they were already reburied. So Dean has taught us that, you know, there's certain things and, and what Dean has done too is because we have ghost sickness, we carry that with us all the time. This isn't something everybody else has to bear the burden of, it's something that we do because we have to go before whichever entity that has our human remains and talk about it, have to want for them. <laughs> We call them the pitiful ones because as we pass, you're supposed to be, we go and we uh, join our relatives on the Milky Way. 
and those ones that are sitting like Tim was talking about, we call them the pitiful ones because they're sitting there with dust on their head. We have to walk by them. This is what an elder told me once. We have to walk by them and they're gonna ask us, why wasn't I good enough to come home? How come you didn't fight for me? How come I have to still be here? along that dusty trail, not walking with their relatives. Those are the things we get to deal with. Those are the burdens we have. So as Dean said, it won't be within his lifetime. It won't be within my lifetime. It won't be within my son's lifetime before we get all of our relatives back. Because we feel that, you know, we were placed here for a reason on this earth. And we respect our dead just as much as we respect the living. And it's nobody's decision to say that we're a curiosity because we're a people, we're still alive, we're still here, we're still very much culturally tied to our land, our people, our places, and we will fight to continue to be who we are because what else can we be? You know, and, um, but we're very thankful for having people like Dean in our lives, having S.K. Willers left because he, um, <laughs> he was a fighter too. He's one of those old Danes. And he goes, so the Bureau of Land Management hired him. And he said, so somebody called me and asked me, can I write my report just a little bit different? And he said, fuck that. I ain't gonna jeopardize my integrity, my work for no one. And I said, good, because that's what we've been dealing with every single turn that we make. When, some, when you asked about the lake at um, the fisheries, when you guys drove in here to the Black Rock Desert, you, you drove right next to another very important lake. It was called Winnemucca Lake. It's dried up. There's nothing there. There's no fish. There's not the marshlands like my tribe has. It's gone because of the damming of the project, the Newlands project, 1903, built and completed in 1906, diverted water from that lake so it could feed my community, which is the Hawk Basin. They diverted it from the Carson River to, or excuse me, the Truckee River to the Carson River, and together our tribes were able to sue the federal government in Public Law 11618. And that's what we have funds to do, to repatriate, to do many different things in our community, restoration of the fisheries. And, but these are the small things that we have to deal with. Cause you know, on a, on a level, trying to get restoration is not just with the land, it's with everything it seems like constantly. So, but anyways, thank you for your question. Sorry. Thank you, Dean, Donna, for your deep teachings in, about your culture. I had the uh, honor several years ago of visiting, actually you, Donna, once. Uh, you might not remember, and of course I've met Dean many times, but I had the honor of being invited to examine an ancient rock art site on your island and with the intention of trying to figure out how to preserve it because it's showing quite a bit of degradation and i think the um many people here being artists would be fascinated to know i was amazed when i got there to find out that it's probably the oldest art in north america uh, dated somewhere between 12 and 14 thousand years ago so Mm -hmm. I believe that's what you call it. The pictures, if you'd like to see the pictures of the, some of this rock art are on the, uh, in the uh, museum, Paiute Museum at Nixon, pictures. Um, so my question is simply, uh, what's happened since? I wasn't able to follow up on what, the, I made some recommendations, but uh, how is that site progressing? Is there any other plan to preserve that rock art? Uh, no, 
we asked a long time ago. We wanted it protected from the weather because the petroglyphs are like 13,000 years old, maybe older than that. You got the fish bones, the backbone of a fish, different things there. You can still go and read them. But we closed that area. I sit on a culture committee at Pyramid Lake. So a lot of places we close to the general public. The east side of the lake we closed only because these people came in and spray painted the rocks around the pyramid stone mother. And we had to go out there and clean it up, take the spray paint off. But um, because the east side of the lake still holds so many burial sites, you know, we pretty much closed it to the general public. But the ancient petroglyph site, I was asking, is there a way we can build a structure to protect it? So these other people with kids, their grandkids, their great-great-grandkids for generations and generations in the future can go and see the rock art that still exists there. Because of rain, the ice in the wintertime, they can slowly, you know, the weather takes it away. So that was my thought was, hey, we could build a big structure there of some kind and protect it so that the future generations will have something to see. So that's how far that came. And it kind of fizzled out. <laughs> but one day it'll happen. I know it'll happen. So, so what he's referring to is a set of uh, petroglyphs. The old or petroglyphs pic along yeah. Winnemucca Lake. Yeah, along Winnemucca Lake. And they're actually, the petroglyphs were etched on a large uh, formation of tufa. And because tu tufa is a uh, carbon, it has carbon in it, they were able to test how old this particular petroglyphs were, the Tenumamamui. And they took testing um, inside of the etchings and outside. They knew that the water level went down and then rose and then went down again. And um, which was kind of sad as the person doing the testing released the information publicly before they shared it with the tribe. Again, that was another uh, disappointment, I think, because they weren't really prepared for the vast amount of people wanting to go to this ancient place that's for 14,000 years old. And throughout this whole area, there's petroglyphs all around our area. It's, um, yeah, my area has some as well. And you could see that the desert patina is, it, there. our boulders are on basalt rock and there's this desert patina that happens and you take away that little layer, you can see the petroglyph. You know how it works. But in our area, this patina has grown in those etchings, so the boulder looks really the same color. And so, you know, we knew that our areas were very, very old, very old. But just a little background on that. Good question. <laughs> First, thank you for allowing us to visit your lands. And um, my question is if there is one or two things that all of us here could do as an action takeaway um, that you would wish for us to do, I wonder what those things might be. One of them is helping Dean. <laughs> Honestly, if um, I have been working with Dean for a number of years now, and he is very patient, very kind, and the things that, you know, it's kind of like getting back to the basic. And 
through those, you're going the doorway is going to be open because Dean has actually met so many people in his vast journey. I mean, he walks to a palace like, where's Dean? Where's Dean? Where's Dean? Because you know he's going to be there, <laughs> you know. But he um, has a lot of knowledge. He his parents were very sharing as well. Um, with themselves and they passed it on to Dean and his family and um, if you were to you guys I think Burning Man here the family of Burning Man is getting it right you know as far as because we see cities built and we see the issues you know on the social level and then also on the um, the governmental side of it but it's always on the lands of the tradition or of, of people. You know, we didn't go anywhere. We have a number of bands that we don't call them by their names, like right here or a little bit further to the north, the grasshopper eaters and the rabbit eaters. This is their territory, but they were reassimilated and or they were removed and put into like the Pyramid Lake tribe or something like that. But these are these are our lands. You know, this is their lands at that time but you know when we travel you always try to like leave no trace but it's really hard to leave no trace because your soul's now there that's part of your trace and you know continue to get actively involved I mean I'm sure you guys might have heard about like the obviously the lithium mines in Nevada if you're from Nevada that's a huge one um it's not this just the tribes. You guys are now a part of our tribe in that respect because we're all being treated the same. We're all in the same boat together with big corporation coming in with big ideas, poisoning all of us, taking from all of us, killing all of us. We all feel the burdens. We feel the pain just the same. So if you see something that you're passionate about and you know it's right and it feels good in your heart, then support it. You know, make that effort and um, empower yourself and just go do it. That's what I'd have to say. Also, you can go on YouTube of all places. <laughs> There's a documentary we did last year that came out, Mining the Sacred. There's another little short film, Dean, that's all it says. And you look under Pembroke Lake Spiritual Leader. You'll see more on me. <laughs> anyway, and they're pretty good. You know, Burning Man came and they did the filming. Really good, really good film segments on what I did, what I'm doing. And also, I was saying at Severn Camp, it took a burner to get this made for me. Dave King, he's here. He has a heart vehicle he drives around at night. He's got a prosthetic himself. We were fighting so hard with Nevada Medicaid to get a prosthetic. It's been three years sitting in a wheelchair. And we found him and he came just like that. He built the prosthetic, so I've been slowly learning to walk on, on it, getting my balance. One day we'll be walking, maybe next year I'll be walking without any aid of any kind, maybe a cane. So we took a burner to help another burner, so, which is good. Like I said, we made so much family out here over the years. Still, We've gotten a lot closer. Really good. Cherub happened to be one of them. He was recruited as my driver by Comfort and Joy, I don't know how many years ago. And we just got to know each other. Now, other than Burning Man, he'll come to all the way from London, England, and visit. You know, it means a lot to me over the years. Other people who've gotten so close will you know we come out here for the golden spike we come out here in october to do prayers one last time and clear this area 
So, you know, you've gotten to know them really close people, family. To me, family nowadays. So, and with the ancient one, I just want to add, when they brought them, they had them in a big box. They thought they were honoring us. So we took him out of the box. We rewrapped him. And I sat there. Everyone went into the other room. I sat there and we talked. We talked about what his life was like. He said, way before the bow and arrows came, they had little, little spear throwers that they used to go hunting. And he said, you know, they were hunting bighorn sheep in our language, Koip. And he said one of the spear throwers hit him in the hip. So he lived in pain. He was like 50 some years old when he passed. Something like that. The spirit cave? Yeah. Yeah, he... He lived to be an old man, but he lived in pain because of that point in his hip. So I asked him, sat there and asked his spirit, what happened? He told me. We were laughing because the cops, you know, said, oh, we'll put him in the, the vault where they keep their evidence. So we came out and the cops had taken all the door away, <laughs> the door off their evidence locker. And we just had a little bundle like this bringing him in. So we got a kick out of that the spirits are still with us. A while ago, I felt something come to like a Halloween. In our old, old stories, grandma, great grandma always talked about looking at the stars at night in the winter time. Said, look at those stars there. They're the seven sisters. I guess they call them Pallades or whatever. That's where our people came. We were brought from there and brought here because our people wanted to live a simple life. So we were brought here from the stars. Even today, we look upon ourselves as being created from the dust of the stars that came. So we are all from the stars, the dust of the stars. So I just wanted to share that with you, so we can continue on with uh, questions. I also, I also wanted to say, you know, because Dean travels far and wide, Indian country is small. <laughs> so we know and share, you know, a lot of our stories are very similar with uh, people around the country. And so if you're from a different part of the state, sometimes even with different parts of the world, you know, you're going to find somebody, you've heard of that, we're only seven people removed from knowing everybody in the world. If you know Dean, you're about two. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much. So much gratitude for this conversation and, and for everybody in your listening. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions now, but if you all want to stick around, I'm sure people would love to come and say hi. Yeah, come on up and ask questions if you want. I will, I will enjoy my coffee, <laughs> my espresso. Um, what else was I going to say? I forgot. Being old, you kind of lose your memory, lose what I was going to say. I was going to say, um, always get to know the people, primitive like people. We're human like you. We're not better than you. Get to know our tribe. We're trying our very best to work with Burning Man. We've always tried our best to work with Burning Man. And it's starting to pay off because things are happening in a good way. So get to know us. We're not. Bad, we're not. My auntie always said, oh, we want, we, we don't scalp no more. Because a lot of people, there's no nothing there to scalp anymore. 
Hey. <laughs> anyway, and we like to laugh at Cherub's finding out being around Indians, he gets teased a lot. He gets stressed a lot. He's, Little he's, things he's, stress he's him get, out. He's getting too good at it because he can come back now. <laughs> yeah, he's getting know. used to the teasing, getting used to all the laughing that we do. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you know, my experience too, I'm sorry, Dean, uh, just in closing that getting me to be a part of Burning Man was not an easy feat. Because, you know, I'm a native Nevadan, born on the res, I'm resed out. And um, so working with um, Burning Man over at the Fly Ranch and getting to opportunity to go over and pick some cattails because that's, you know, our, our thing. Um, getting to know the people, getting to know what you guys really do here and because you know I never really had a curiosity you know I, I kind of I called it the burnout man because people out there are burnt out they come here to rejuvenate or something you know because of all the beautiful artwork and you know everybody has an opportunity to express themselves I didn't judge but it's not my thing I live in the desert 24 7 so how about it <laughs> you know go go out there and live live your best life so you know to get um to, for me to come out here, you know, this is our backyard, and uh, it kind of took a lot, and it takes certain people, because when you start realizing that a community of this magnitude, it comes in, you know, like a light, and goes out like a light, you know, every year, and then is the people that are here that are hanging out afterwards, is what really those, you know, hopefully you have, if you're passionate enough, you will stick around, and even after Burning Man goes away, you know, hit Dean up. He's on Facebook. He's on there all the time. He, in the middle of the night. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, you know, really connect with individuals, and they have done that, at least for me, because I'm one of those people who, um, I wouldn't say a skeptic, but, you know, it just wasn't something that I have. But I think in talking and understanding, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come out here because... It uh, changes my viewpoint. You know, there's so many people who have, we don't know what another person's, you know, life is like outside of this. You don't know their struggles. We don't know their successes. You know, there are the positive side, the negative side, but all I see now is just beautiful people and who want to share and share in something common and something bigger. And if you could take anything away from this, I think what you guys are doing here is or what we, because I'm a burner now, <laughs> what we're doing here is sharing that vibe, you know, sharing it so that uh, people kind of get it. Because, you know, I was one of those hardcore, didn't get it, but I get it. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. And thank you, Dean, for always being there. <laughs> <laughs>